Food deserts are a growing problem in America, where millions of Americans do not have access to healthy food. That's in addition to the fact that many live far away from grocery stores, and those who do live near one have to deal with the now rising cost of food. One study found that the average household grocery cost per month is $475, with that number likely to go up. It's clear the system needs a new model. You're listening to Found, TechCrunch's podcast that brings you the stories behind the startups. And today we're talking with Nick Green, the co-founder and CEO of Thrive Market, a membership-based online grocery store that focuses on natural and organic food and household products. I'm Becca Skutak, and here nerding out about grocery logistics with me is my fabulous co-host, Dominic Bedori davis And of course, before we get into our conversation with Nick, we have our two truths and a lie. And at the end, we'll tell you which one isn't true. So listen closely to see what is the lie. Is it that one of Thrive's co-founders grew up on a commune where he learned the importance of organic foods? That some of Thrive Market's first investors were influencers and content creators? Or is the lie that Nick realized a year into building the company that they needed to switch all their packaging into being sustainable? Ooh, those all sound like great options. So listeners, you will just have to keep listening to find out. And here was our conversation with Nick. Hey, Nick. How's it going? It's going great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I'm going to say I prepped for this conversation not in the best way because I am currently hungry and I have kind of have a feeling I'm going to be more hungry as we keep talking. That's actually not a bad state of mind. If we're going to talk about food, you might as well be having it on your mind to begin with. That is true. Maybe that's right. But why don't we start by having you tell our listeners a little bit about Thrive Market and maybe a little bit about why we are going to be talking about food. Sure. So Thrive Market is a membership-based e-commerce platform that makes healthy and sustainable living easy, affordable, and accessible to anyone. So our paid members pay $60 a year for a membership. They get access to a curated assortment of kind of the best natural, organic, sustainable, regenerative, you name it, better for you products. It's the kind of stuff that you'd find at a health food retailer like Whole Foods or even kind of a mom and pop, a health food store, a lot of things you wouldn't find in a conventional grocery store. And then they're all at discounted prices through that membership model. Every paid membership then sponsors a free membership for a low-income family, a first responder, a military veteran, a teacher or a student. And we're really trying to build a community that can create ultimately a movement so that it's not just people in high income areas and urban areas and places that have a health food store down the corner or on the corner to eat healthy, but really anyone, any place, any background can get access to better for you products at an affordable price. That's kind of thrive at a high level. It's mostly food. So like call it 60 to 70% of the assortment is food stuff. Kind of all of your pantry stables. We also have a frozen assortment of meat and seafood. We even sell you know, organic wine and regenerative wine. But there's a lot of non-food products as well. So I think more and more people are not only looking at how do I put healthier things in my body, but also on my body and in my home. And these kinds of products also have a really significant effect through sourcing and supply chain and ingredients on the environment. So for conscious consumers that want to kind of vote with their dollars and make good decisions for their family, for their health, and also for the planet, we're ultimately trying to build a one-stop shop where you can get all your stuff on Thrive. And with the movement toward eating better and using these cleaner products that we've been kind of seeing for quite a while now, it is surprising to think that a lot of this was fully taking place if you happen to live near a store that sold those products as opposed to be able to find a lot of them online. So I'm curious, what made you decide to get into this space to begin with. How did you discover that this was a problem? Well, I lived that problem firsthand growing up. So I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or outside Minneapolis, Minnesota. And being middle class in the Midwest in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of really unhealthy food. Processed foods were kind of the name of the game. And there wasn't a lot of awareness of what the results in human health were from those foods. My mom happened to be one of those kind of interesting, I will say like vigilante warriors, if you will, on the health front back when no one was really thinking about this stuff. And it really came from her own experience with her family. Um, so she grew up in a large Mexican-American family, very working class, and her siblings have diabetes. Many people had issues with obesity and weight. And then ultimately there was issues with cancer and all sorts of other chronic diseases as people got older. And so she was really determined to make a change in our lifestyle. And happened to be that kind of like independent researcher, do it herself person that went out at a time when, you know, there wasn't the internet. Right. And said, I'm going to cut out sugar for my kid's diet. I'm going to go organic. I'm going to reduce processed foods. And I saw how hard she had to work to make that happen. 
You know, there were not, there wasn't a Whole Foods on the corner. If there had been, we wouldn't have been able to afford the price premiums. And so I lived that, you know, fast forward 20 some years, I had sold an education company and was thinking about what I wanted to do next and met my co-founder, Gennar, who had kind of the most different possible childhood you can imagine. He actually grew up on a communal farm in Ojai where they were growing their own food and sourcing wholesale organic products from all over the country. And he had this vision for taking that to the masses, which was you know, basically taking it to places like where I grew up. And when I first met him, what actually shocked me was to realize, and I had lived in Boston for seven years before that and then moved to LA, you know, that in most of the country, there still was the same kind of situation more or less that my mom was dealing with, where prices were really high, there wasn't access if you didn't have a brick and mortar store that was nearby. And a lot of people didn't know where to start. So basically, he pitched me initially on investing on an idea that was to build the Groupon for healthy food. And by the end of that first meeting, I was pitching him on building something together that could achieve that mission. And the mission's been the same since day one, you know, make healthy and sustainable living easy, affordable, accessible to everyone. And it's been very personal. And I think that North Star for us has enabled us to you know, scale and stay at it now for nearly a decade, because that was back in 2014 that we started. And you just mentioned a little bit that your co-founder came to you with a pitch of how to do this, which isn't exactly what it ended up becoming. Was where you guys are now your first idea? Walk me through what it was like having this idea, having this mission, and then sort of landing on the strategy that you guys ended up going with for Thrive. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, the short answer is no. The business has evolved and changed and grown past kind of our wildest dreams. And I think that that flexibility to change and pivot and add on and also push through when things got really tough, you know, all of that was made possible by that mission. You know, I think a lot of business or a lot of people tend to think that, you know, mission-based business, that that can kind of be a handicap. But in our case, it was absolutely not only you know, a asset, it was kind of the asset that gave us that through line on everything we did. And honestly, it's the reason why like, we were able to pivot very quickly off of that Groupon type model. And that's where we got into doing membership. We started out with just third-party brands, and then we added our own brand. We started out with just non-perishable products and just in the food category. Then we layered on other categories and ultimately got into frozen. And we just use that mission as a filter for everything we do. If it aligns to the mission, if it builds on that foundation of making healthy and sustainable living accessible, then you know we kind of stack rank impact and can make decisions that way, particularly as the business has grown. You know, we're now nearly a thousand employees. You know, we have a million square feet of warehouse space. We're carrying tens of millions of dollars of inventory. You know, the stakes of decisions that you make from a business standpoint go up and become more and more complex. I think having that like simple litmus test of does this feed the mission has actually enabled us to adapt. So, you know, when we started, basically all we had was Groupon for healthy food to achieve this mission. The Groupon part obviously dropped out, but you know that mission has stayed the same and everything we've built since then has been around that. And I know thinking about the fact that you guys are an e-commerce platform, I know a lot of people weren't really used to say buying groceries or buying kind of products like that online prior to COVID and knowing you guys started quite a bit before that. Personally, Dom and I have talked about this on the show before. I still have never ordered groceries online, which I know I'm in the minority oh, we're of people change that. who have done that. But I am curious, what was it like? We'll change that today. <laughs> what was it like getting people to shop in this way? Because especially when you guys were getting started, of course, a lot of us were buying a ton of stuff on the internet by that point already. But Groceries wasn't really one of them. And so what was it like kind of getting people to both sign on to buying that online, but also the membership piece? Because I know, I mean, I'm a Costco member, so I get the membership yeah. for buying goods, but it's not as common, obviously, in this kind of a category. Yeah. So two separate questions, but both really important. So yes, like there's kind of a paradigm shift required that, to your point, was accelerated during the pandemic, where most people prior to the pandemic had not ever shopped for groceries in an e-commerce setting. Obviously, in 2014, that was true for, you know, call it 98, 99% of American families. You know, the kind of tragedy of that is that if you don't have the density of sort of high income, you aren't going to end up with high end retail locations that carry these like better for you natural organic products. So if you look at Whole Foods footprint today, or you look at the footprint of any natural organic chain or any independent retailers, they are in dense urban areas in zip codes with high income. And they're catering to a very sort of curated, and so I would say like elevated consumer. And right now, about 50% of Americans, this is today in 2024, still don't live within driving distance of a health food retailer. In 2014, the number was even more dramatic. So for us, we said, look, there isn't really a business model 
because there is the population density in some of these areas or there's not the wealth density to go and open up a brick and mortar location. And if we wanted to start out and be brick and mortar, that would take years to do anyway, right? It took 20 plus years for Whole Foods to roll out its footprint. Like e-commerce was the obvious solution to that. And the obvious challenge was how do we convince people to buy these things online? And the way that we handled that was by starting with the areas of the catalog and really sticking to the area of the catalog that has the least barriers to change. So a lot of people want to like touch the avocado and see if it's right. They want to look at the banana, like for those fresh foods and refrigerated, I think it's going to be a much slower process. But the core of our assortment is actually products that, you know, go in your pantry, they go in your medicine cabinet and they come in a box or in a package and they don't require that. So because it's a more standardized item and because it's not perishable, it actually works really well for e-commerce. And that's where we've focused. But to be honest, like it was definitely a process to first, even before convincing consumers, we had to convince investors. And like we got rejected by every institutional investor we talked to. Mm -hmm. We ended up having to raise money in like fifteen to $25,000 chunks from health and wellness influencers and thought leaders and people that aligned with the mission because there was no major investor that would give us money back at the beginning. What was really cool, though, is that right away when we launched, we saw the latent demand of people that, to my point earlier, didn't necessarily live near Whole Foods, wanted to access the lifestyle, and were actually really willing to do it online if that was the only way to make it happen. And then to your question about the membership, Very similar. So like geography is one barrier to getting healthy. If you don't have a brick and mortar retailer in your area, you got to go with e-commerce. That's why we went with e-commerce. But another barrier is is price. And so if the average premium for natural organic products is anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, we had to figure out a model where we could essentially sell the products at wholesale. And that's where Costco became the template, right? Costco is a wholesale buying club. We said, can we do this for these higher quality products? And the membership where people you know, pay up front, they get access then to like, basically we sell the products at a very low margin. And then what was interesting there is that the membership also enabled us to power an even more kind of ambitious part of our mission, which was reaching people that not only can't afford the products, but also wouldn't be able to afford the membership. So that's where we have every paid membership sponsoring a free membership for a family in need. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of those members today, and it's actually been good for our business. Like they're spending tens of millions of dollars on thrivemarket.com each year. So it's good for business. It's also good for the mission. And I think one of the ways we've built this community where people feel like they're coming together and not only supporting their healthy lifestyle, but also those of other people. And what about Thrive Market made those early investors kind of go on pause? What about Thrive Market? And I'm assuming like the grocery sector in general. I mean, part of it was very rational in that there had been like back in the web van days, you know, a number of would be e-commerce players and kind of the first dot com bubble in the grocery space. And absolutely none of them succeeded. Even Amazon had tried to make forays into grocery and not been very successful with it. So I think part of it was very rational. I think part of it honestly was just a bias and not in like a sort of negative or pernicious way, but just a reality of like most of the investors we were talking to lived in LA and New York and San Francisco. Most of them were, you know, men who didn't do their own grocery shopping. Most of them are themselves high income. Like the question that we got most often when we went to these investors was, you know, how are you going to compete with Whole Foods? And our answer was, we're not. Like Whole Foods is catered to this like tiny rarefied air of consumers who can afford the price premiums and happen to live in driving distance of the Whole Foods. We're going after all the people that don't and can't. And it turns out that's actually a much bigger market. So we think it's a bigger business opportunity. But yeah, I think they didn't see it. What was interesting is how quickly the tide turned when we got out and got traction. And a lot of the same VCs that you know wouldn't take a second meeting with us a few months earlier, we're now coming back and saying, hey, we get it. We see it now. We want to come in. And, you know, to their credit, like they were quick to, you know, correct their their bias and say, we were wrong. You proved this out. Let's do it. No, that's so interesting. Yeah, because, of course, they've probably never been to a food desert, like just being in L.A. and SF and all these things. Food deserts are like a massive problem, by the way. I don't know why people don't like realize that. It's yeah. I mean, you, it's the classic like middle of the country is considered flyover, right? Like a lot of a lot of these investors haven't. I think one of the other things that's quite interesting is it's not just the middle of the country, like even in L.A. or San Francisco or New York, there are food deserts. They're not it's what I would call like a health food desert where people are shopping like they're going to the convenience store to buy their food. Or if people are using public transportation, even if it's within driving distance, it may not be within reasonable distance for them to get to 
a healthy grocery store. So yeah, it is, it's a major problem. It was then, it still is today. And I actually think back to the e-commerce point, like e-commerce can solve that. You know, one of the recent efforts that we've really focused on is for folks that are on EBT using food stamps. And there's, you know, over 40 million Americans, many of them parents, you know, single parents with kids who use EBT as their primary source of funds for grocery shopping. Until literally a month ago, you could not use EBT on any pure play e-commerce retailers website. So we're the first ones to be able to accept food stamps online. That's pure play e-commerce. And that's a huge watershed moment for people that, you know, again, tens of millions of American families who use this as their form of, of shopping budget. The problem is huge. The problem has been huge for a long time, but it is I'm really optimistic that we and others and even like the USDA now making this shift, you know, we're going to start making real inroads there. I wanted to talk to you about the food stamps, but before I get there, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the logistics of the early days, because how do you run a food company? Like, where do you store the food? Like, how are you handling like the logistics really early on? So it's interesting that you asked that, because that's probably another reason that all those investors rejected us. We didn't have great answers to those questions, honestly. Like neither, you know, Gennar nor I had experience in e-commerce. Our third co-founder, Sasha, who is our CTO, did. And he had a business they'd used a 3PL. So he knew just enough to be dangerous and actually built out our initial warehouse. So it was pretty much fly by the seat of our pants in the early days. Fortunately, at that time, you know, it was a very curated assortment. We had great partnerships with the brands who really helped us. And we just got in there and like rolled up our sleeves. And as we scaled, because it happened so quickly, we were also able to kind of punch above our weight and bring in really seasoned folks. So we like brought in a very senior fulfillment person who had spent most of his career at Kroger within six months of launching the business. And that's been a a real theme throughout the history of Thrive is I think the mission, not only has it been this North Star for us to execute, but it's also been a real magnet for talent where people that frankly, we have no business at any given stage hiring would come in early because they believed what we were doing and wanted to be part of it. You know, we had the same thing. Our chief merchandising officer joined us. He had run, you know, a billion dollar division at Whole Foods and came in literally pre-launch to build out our assortment. So the logistics, you know, I think we didn't fully appreciate how complex and challenging and frankly, like difficult to get to scale these kinds of businesses are because they are low margin, because they're very competitive, because they're capital intensive. But again, like the mission gave us the where there's a will, there's a way. And at every turn, whether it was a person coming in, whether it was us rolling up our sleeves and digging in ourselves, like we were able to kind of figure it out. And it was a humbling experience. Like sometimes things took longer than they should have. But, you know, I look at back at it and here we are nine years later, we have, you know, 1.5 million members. We're doing hundreds of millions of dollars of sales annually. And, you know, we're shipping hundreds of millions of products in any given year out of a you know fulfillment network that has more than a million square feet of warehouse space and it employs 700 plus people. So it's, it's pretty incredible. If you do have that, the motivation is strong enough over the course of a little bit of time, you can really get there. Listeners of the show have known or have heard me talk about this in the past, but I'm very interested in the grocery logistics space. I read a whole book on it and I just find the whole thing fascinating because like you said, it is those low margins. It's a lot of moving parts. It's not really clear always exactly what the right thing to do is off the bat. So it is interesting to hear kind of like how you guys have been able to grow into that side of the business. But I do want to talk a little bit about, and I know Dom had mentioned it, about the process of working to be able to accept food stamps. Because especially if you guys are the first e-commerce retailer who can accept these, like what was that process like? And like, was it difficult being able to kind of get through, I'm sure, lots of bureaucracy and things like that to be able to kind of get that ability. So maybe if you want to talk a little bit about like what that was like. Yeah, I mean, it it was really challenging and it took a lot of time. So we ran our first or we first approached the USDA back in 2015, just saying, hey, it's kind of crazy that you can buy, you know, like orange soda and chips at your corner store with food stamps, but you can't buy healthy food online. Like, that's not right. They're like, we agree, but we don't know online and, you know, we don't have any plans to do it. So way back in 2016, we actually did a petition and went out to not only our members, but just like broader kind of online 
aligned folks who came through many of our influencers and celebrities that got on board. And we got more than 300,000 signatures in like six weeks with this petition to basically solicit the USDA to start accepting food stamps online. And that catalyzed a pilot program that I think kicked off like a year or two later. And for a variety of reasons that were kind of frustrating at the time, like we weren't actually able to be part of that pilot. Mm. And then it wasn't until the pandemic that things started to move a little bit again, when, you know, all of a sudden, to your point earlier, like the floodgates opened on online and there was this whole question of like, is the future of grocery going to be entirely online? And for how long could that be the case? And so I think they had a very urgent forcing function at that point to do something. And they accelerated then, I think it was 2021, that we finally, they agreed to engage with a pure play e-commerce retailer. At the time, they were very concerned that if you didn't have a brick and mortar presence, they wouldn't really know how to work with you. And then, you know, it's taken a couple of years since then to just get things going. So I would contrast like that process with the operational challenges, which are hard, but are ultimately in your control. Right. And if you have enough creativity and you bring the right people to play, you can solve it. This one was really tough just because, you know, our hands were tied. You know, no fault to the USDA. I think they got it and they wanted to make it happen, but they're a huge organization. It's a program serving, again, 40 million plus families. They, they're just moving a big ship and they don't know what they don't know. So like for them, one big concern was fraud. And it turns out it's actually easier to control fraud, I would argue, online. There's a lot more that you can do when you have just one point of purchase and like we spend a lot already building all those fraud prevention mechanisms, which work for any payment method and now will work just as well for SNAP BBT. But, you know, explaining that to an organization that hasn't worked with online retailers, there was just a lot of skepticism. So to their credit, they got there. You know, we feel like, oh, I wish it would have happened faster, but now it's day one. And all right, the big question now is let's look forward. And how do we now make up for lost time ramp it out as aggressively and as quickly as we can and just get the word out there with a megaphone to families that this is now an option. Yeah, it is interesting to think about because while that obviously is not fast if you kind of started the conversation in 2016 compared to some other government initiatives that probably isn't as slow as it could have been. Well, and think about how many things never get done at all. Right. That's the reality is like there's a lot of things that should happen that just get in the logjam. So yeah, we're grateful that we're here. And I think we learned a lot, too, about, like, how can we advocate and work effectively with a government program? But all in all, we're just happy to be you know, looking forward now with a huge business opportunity and a just massive mission opportunity to open this thing up. And the, the early numbers have been really encouraging. Like, we're seeing many more new members coming in than we expected that are using food stamps. We're learning a lot about those members' preferences and what are the products they want to see? How can we make the user experience easier for them? And fortunately, because we already had that pool of Gibbs members who were shopping on site, I think we already had a pretty well-optimized experience, even for you know a consumer that's maybe not as familiar with some of the dietary tribes and quality standards. And so it's been a really fun process to say, all right, how can we be a resource for education? How can we make it simpler and easier for these folks? And similar to when we launched the business at the very beginning, what we're seeing is there's this latent demand of people that really want access. They just haven't had the opportunity today. Do you think that the USDA or something that really helped them understand what Thrive was doing, do you think that like the pandemic helped accelerate the understanding of the necessity of a product like this? 1,000%. Yeah, I mean, it was just a massive forcing function because you you went from before, like a day prior to the pandemic, you had some like small percentage of the population that was either purchasing groceries online and it, like an even smaller percent that could only purchase them online, right? Because they were homebound for some physical or whatever reason. The day after the pandemic, like you had lockdowns and literally, you know, nearly 100% of people had that as their only option. So I think it was like just like I said before, a really, really intense forcing function to say, you know, we got to do something, especially because at that point, like people didn't know how long lockdowns would go on. So when you have folks who depend on SNAP for their groceries, it's like, what do we do? And initially their response was to work with brick and mortar grocers that had a delivery option. So it's, you know, they have an online portal, but they would also have a brick and mortar presence. The challenge with that is, again, if you're in one of those food deserts or those health food deserts where that brick and mortar grocery store isn't nearby, they're not going to deliver to you. So I think they prioritized it the right way at that point, and they did work with urgency. But, you know, again, they were moving a, a big ship and it took time. Logistically, I imagine the pandemic was also kind of a wild time for you. Because I oh, imagine... You have no it, idea. It was 
if you're interested in e-commerce logistics, like it's one of the most crazy, fascinating, terrifying case studies of like, because on the demand side, it was huge, right? Like all of a sudden our potential member base is like the whole country where everybody is is shopping in this way. I actually think for us, one thing that we benefited from was the membership wall. So we, because we charge $60, we didn't get a bunch of people flooding in just to stock up on toilet paper and like buy all of the hand sanitizer they can. We really did filter for people that actually wanted to make a one-year commitment, care about healthy living. So that helped us, but it was still crazy demand. And then on the supply chain side, it was like massive disruption where you had just supply chain shortages and there was the backups at the port and just all kinds of craziness there. And frankly, the part for us that was actually the most challenging was, you know, we employed at that point about 500 people in our fulfillment centers. You know, now it's close to a thousand people and those people have to show up to work, right? There's no way for us to get orders out without them being physically present. And I remember at that time, like we didn't know whether COVID could be spread from touching a, a surface. We didn't know whether it could be like a worker had COVID, if you could have COVID on the products and like come to someone's home via a box. So there was so much like lack of information, misinformation, fear. And our number one priority at that point was like, one, we have to make sure our members are safe. And even before that, we have to make sure that our thrivers are safe, our workers are. So it was this really acute moment for our mission. I think like the whole company rallied around it and it was really beautiful in a lot of ways where I think we felt as much purpose as we ever have. But it was also really scary, really intense. And, you know, I think kind of took us to a different place for really a year and a half of the pandemic. More from this conversation right after a quick break. And I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Toward the top of the call, you mentioned that obviously the market has sparked from something that was very personal to you, something that sort of a lived experience you had as a child, but also that you had started another company prior to Thrive. So I'm curious, sort of how did you know personally when it was the right time to launch this company, both timing wise for you personally, but also timing wise for the market in general? How did that all come to be? Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say I had some grand master plan I put together, you know, before each company. But honestly, my entrepreneurial journey has been so organic, uh, no pun intended, where, you know, the, my first business was in the test prep space. It was very opportunistic in that basically I had done well in the SAT. I grew up in an area where and like from a family that like my parents never would have paid a thousand dollars to do a Princeton review or a Kaplan class. And there was kids in my class that had, you know, were as smart as I was, but didn't do well in the SAT. And it totally changed kind of what opportunities we had getting into college. And so that business was really around access to, but it was access education to say, hey, it's not right that like when I got to Harvard, all of my peers who had done also very well in the SAT had been getting tutored and getting prep and from families that really could provide or they went to a prep school where, you know, the test prep was there. Whereas like coming from a public school in the Midwest, you know, I got lucky and I did well. Other kids didn't do as well. And then that closed doors. So we actually started, it was called Ivy Insiders. We basically hired first Harvard undergrads, but then other undergrads from across the Ivy League to go back to their hometowns and teach test prep courses. Hmm. So it was, I wouldn't have described it as a mission-driven business at the time, but it really was. And like we had a no empty seats policy where if someone couldn't pay for the program, they could do it for free. Our base price was half the price of Prince Review and Kaplan. You know, I just felt, and I wouldn't have even described that as building a business initially. It was like something I was doing and then all of a sudden it was a business. And then all of a sudden we got to scale. And then when we got an acquisition offer and I probably sold it too early because we were only four years in. But when I stepped back from that, it just, I basically wanted to do something that was equally impactful, but had an opportunity to sort of be even more fundamental and get to bigger scale. And so that's what got me thinking about health. You know, I really do trace both the businesses in a way back to my mom, because the two things that were the pillars for her were education and health. And, you know, again, she came from a family that was very working class. You know, she didn't graduate from college. No one in her family had to date. And so, you know, me going to a four-year college was a huge deal. Us being healthy was a huge deal for her. And so, you know, both businesses came from personal experiences. And, you know, I can't say that with Thrive either, I did like a market analysis or like, is this the right time? You know, probably we were a little bit early, honestly, in 2014. But I think you have to strike when there's inspiration and know that there's going to be twists and turns. You're never going to get anything perfect. And if you believe in what you're doing and if you're right on the broad strokes, you can get there. And since this is your second company, is there anything you learned from the experience with your first startup that you either took with you purposefully into Thrive or something that you were like, you know, I'm going to try to approach that differently this time around? I mean, so much. 
One was to the benefit of having co-founders. I was a solo entrepreneur on my first business. The second was having investors, <laughs> so it's not all of your own money on the line, you know, creating more just like stress and intensity. I think the third was being in a big market. Like test prep was a good size market, but even as we got quite large, there was a ceiling on how big that business could get. I think another was just the power of the mission, which I saw like as we got going with ID Insiders, even though I wouldn't have called it an access-oriented mission, it was. And that became this rallying call, both for our customers and for our employees. And I wanted to do something, like I said, even more fundamental. And the only thing, from my perspective, more fundamental than education from an opportunity standpoint is, is health. So all of those things were things I learned. That said, you know, I was... 26 when I sold Ivy Insiders. I was 28 or 29 when I started Thrive. And like, I thought I'd learned a lot, but, but I also subsequently have found out how much I still had to learn. And Thrive has been, it's it's been a very humbling experience where the greatest asset in, in this company has been all the amazing team members we brought in. And the most important kind of skill I've had is just recognizing the skills that I don't have and bringing in the right people that align with the mission, but have very different aptitudes and really different talents and skills so that we can go out and, and make the mission work. Yeah. And I was actually going to ask you about that because it seems like you have four co-founders. Yeah. How do you, how does that work? Like, how do you divide responsibilities? Is there any like egos? <laughs> like, what's the draw? Like, how does it work? How does it work? Yeah. I think like, you know, being solo is not enough. Maybe four is is too many. But honestly, again, I, I don't think you can like engineer or control that. Like, Gennar had the original vision and the mission and he and I got together. We first worked with like an external agency to build the platform, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of our own money and got nothing for it. And so we said, all right, we need a technical co-founder. And that's what brought Sasha in. None of the three of us had experience building a lifestyle brand. And so that was the, the genesis of bringing in Kate, who is our, she was like brand and content. You know, we're not all day to day with the business anymore. Both Kate and Gennar have, have stepped away and, and done other things. Sasha and I are still here, but I think it, at those critical junctures, each of us brought really different things to the table. And I don't think we could have built, like we wouldn't have gotten where we've gotten had all four of us not been there at those critical points. Were there clashes of personality? Are there ego issues? Of course, always. But I think if you have good people who believe in the mission, you know, that becomes, again, that like that sanity check. And all four of us really did in a way that I think ultimately has enabled us to be effective and also be like self-aware of when it's the right time for someone to step away operationally, what are their skill sets that we need outside the co-founding team. So yeah, it's not all flowers and whatever the expression is, but I think we've been really lucky to just have like good people with that core team. And that's allowed us to, I think from there, build a great team beyond the co-founding team. And talking about building out that team, I do want to ask, because I'm always interested when you are talking about such a mission-oriented company. Of course, you're having people come to the company who have backgrounds in the roles they're applying for. You have people coming who are literally applying because they're obsessed with the mission. They really want to make that kind of a thing happen. How do you, when hiring, but also working with your underlying employees, how do you help balance the mission-driven side? But of course, the this is a for-profit business. Sometimes we have to make hard decisions and things like that. Like, How do you find you can kind of walk that line? I love that question. And I'll, I'll answer it in two parts because First, I think there's an assumption on that tension that you described that, you know, kind of the mission and the business opportunity are like two separate things and that they're going to come into conflict. And one of the things that we really work to do with the teams and one of the things I really believe at just like my core is that that doesn't have to be the case, right? That it doesn't have to be zero sum. And in fact, the mission can really be a catalyst to the business, and that if you are creative enough, you should always be able to find a solution that honors and like seizes on the opportunity of both sides. So I know that sounds like very abstract, but if you look at the membership model, like the membership model enables our economics to work, but it also powers the mission with the Thrive Gives program. If you look at carbon neutral shipping, that's something that it costs us money, obviously, to do that. The plastic waste reduction that we do in the, in the packaging, the consolidation of orders, but all those things also create loyalty and differentiation and, you know, real like member engagement and honestly, like member evangelism, where they're so different than what most companies do. When a member talks about Thrive with their friends, they're not talking about like, oh, I saved $3 on my almond butter. They're saying, isn't this amazing what this company does? And like, you know, my membership sponsored a free one for a low-income family and yada, yada, yada. They like to talk about the mission. So I actually think it's been an asset. We've also looked at like 
really specific things. Like when we went zero waste in our fulfillment centers, we looked for opportunities that not only reduced our waste, but also improved our efficiency. Those efforts have been ROI positive from a business standpoint. We know, and we've wanted to raise quality standards and we've gone up the supply chain to do private label. Oftentimes that's actually allowed us to capture more margin and cut out different middlemen and consolidate and make our business more efficient. Those are a few examples, but they're all over the place where I feel like we've been able to pursue the business opportunity through the mission. And the challenge that we give to our employees, to our thrivers, is that's the name of the game. That's what we have to do. We want to show that a stakeholder-driven business can also be a shareholder-driven business, that those two don't have to be in tension. That's something I'm really passionate about. And then to the point around hiring, we just used, again, the mission is the screen. So just like we run every strategic initiative through the mission to decide how we prioritize it, we do the same thing for people. I think what we find is that One, the mission attracts people that are very talented because a lot of people that have great skills also have great expectations and they want to do something with their time and with their energy that matters. So I do think it's a really positive selection factor. And then I also think that when you get people into a role that aligns with their purpose, it turbocharges their level of engagement. You know, there you get the discretionary effort and the collaborative qualities. And also like back to the question around kind of ego, like you get a lot lower ego, I think, when people really are aligned with with what you're doing as a business. So I feel like the mission is our superpower in every respect, but I think especially with people and with energizing the team, it's been absolutely huge. And I would say it's even more important now in a remote first environment where you got to get people to be connected despite the fact that they're not seeing each other every day. You need people to be working hard despite the fact that they're not coming into an office every day. And I think if we didn't have the mission, all of those things would be a lot harder. And I know that we're kind of running out of time, but I did want to touch upon the social impact arm that you have and just kind of when you realized you wanted to launch that and how things have been going. I mean, it's been really since the beginning. I assume when you say social impact, you're talking about the access-oriented side. So we we kind of think about the mission as there's two dimensions. One is access, one is sustainability. So it's health for people and health for the planet. And you know, on the planet side, we're doing all the stuff with carbon neutral shipping, zero waste fulfillment, plastic neutral, becoming a public benefit corporation, just baking all of that sustainability into our business. On the access side, I actually feel like that is in the core of the membership model to begin with, because we our membership model enables us to offer at a price point products that wouldn't otherwise be accessible to middle class, middle Americans. And if you look at our paid membership base, we have 1.5 million paid members. They are average household income under $100,000. 50% are in the Midwest and the Southeast. Well over 60% of incoming members are families. So we are hitting that goal of really being an expansive, inclusive platform. But for the specific kind of access-oriented initiatives, those are things where we've tried to go even a step further to be able to access people that aren't just middle class, but actually working class or people that may be in real financial need. And so there, you know, we start with giving away the free membership. We also have raised more than $13 million through donation at checkout. This is another good example of something that doesn't hurt the business and actually helps people because we're not paying those dollars. It's actually our members who are donating those dollars. We just serve as the conduit. We just facilitate it. But those dollars go directly into the shopping budgets of our Gives members and enable them to get further discounts on the platform. So when I kind of zoom out today and look at, you know, if you're a low-income family, what Thrive can offer you. Well, first, you can come online, get a free membership. Second, you can use your food stamps online. Third, you get these stipends that are funded by your membership community so that you get even further discounts on the platform. And so, you know, the the ultimate vision there is like, let's break down all the barriers that we can for folks, no matter where they come from, what their background is. And again, today we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of active gifts members. I want that number to be in the millions. As I said before, there's 40 million Americans on food stamps. So at some point it should be in the tens of millions. You know, we feel like we've done a lot, but we're, we're really just getting started. And unfortunately, we are out of time, but that feels like a perfect place to wrap up anyway. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was really fun. Thanks to you both. And that was our conversation with Nick. Dom, before we dive in, what was the lie? The lie was obviously that Nick realized a year into building the company that he needed to switch all the packaging to be sustainable. That is a lie because Thrive Market has always been sustainable and they've been carbon neutral practically since the beginning. 
No, it's so good to hear that too, because I feel with companies that are, are marketing themselves as sustainable businesses, there's always like little holes that they don't think about from the beginning. Like it's obviously so much more difficult to build in this way. And you always hear of brands being like, oops, like their packaging, we it never occurred to us that delivering this way was bad for the environment or like we didn't know that the caps on our plastic bottles did X, Y, Z. And they're like, so we've changed it, which is good. But it's like you so rarely hear about companies who are like, actually, no, we actually thought all of it through from the beginning and have been doing that the whole time. Yeah, I know. I was trying to think of like cons to the business model, but I couldn't find any holes. Like it just seems that they do what they say and there's no like gotcha, you know? Yeah, because like I wanted to be like, well, $60 obviously for a lot of people doesn't feel like a lot to spend on this. But if you're struggling to buy groceries already, that would seem like a lot. And then they're like, no, we give them out to those people for free. And I was like, well, okay. Like, of course you do. Of course you do. Of course you do. Oh, I know. (laughs) And especially when he talked about how they became like the first online grocery store to accept Snap and EBT, like that's so interesting. It's crazy to think of how much the pandemic played a role in maybe moving that a little faster than it would have gone otherwise. I know. Like, I I remember the first time I realized that Whole Foods also accepted it. And I was like, oh, I was like, this is actually really cool. This is like convenient. This is, you know, modern, I guess, in a sense. Like, I don't know. I never really thought about it, but I was like, okay, cool. Whole Foods is like, cool, I guess. I'm biased because that's where I shop. But (laughs) Super Thrive Market to also accept it. I just felt like it was so like with the times, I guess. I don't know, like people want organic food and they want, I'm a delivery girl. So, you know, you want to be able to get it online. And it's kind of like meeting the customer where they are. And I'm not surprised that the USDA was a little slow on it because like it is a big ship, I guess. But I'm glad they caught on because now I think that that's like a really useful way to use the food stamps. And what he said too about when the USDA first started looking to like pilot this and they went with healthier grocery stores to start. And they quickly realized that it was like, well, no, half the issue here is that these people don't live near those places to begin with. So it's like they can't get those groceries delivered from Whole Foods, from an equivalent. Like they literally don't have access. And then the SDA was like, oh, okay. Time to like, I feel like this must have been, I don't want to say it was smooth because it probably wasn't, but like this must have been like one of the smoothest. Like I'm pushing the government to do something and they actually did it. Yeah, I know, because it's like, no, the problem is they're not near the Whole Foods, duh. Like, right. what? But because like when you're talking about the government, there's always or at least I feel like there's always hoops. There's always hurdles. There's always something. There's always drama. So I was expecting a story of like chaos. But of course, it, it wasn't that. It was just like they were just a little bit slow to get back to them, but then realized it. And I'm sure the pandemic also really helped make that make sense because it's like well you can't even go into the whole foods and then you don't live near one and delivery fees are high come on girl so yeah it's interesting to think of just like how much the pandemic helped this company in general like they were founded 2014 so founded obviously six years before that happened but like nick was talking about like no one bought groceries online then and some of us i know you are not in this camp some of us still don't so it's like it's hard i remember when i bought magic spoon for the first time and like the fact that i was like buying cereal online and shipping it to my house felt insane. So it's like, it was nice that they're able to still be able to grow despite people not really having that natural behavior of buying that kind of stuff online. And then obviously the pandemic helps with that. I know I'm thinking of all like the conspiracy theories you could have, like it's 2014 and someone's like, yeah, I'll like deliver groceries to you or something like that. And you're (laughs) like, what is this? Like, is this real? Is this true? Like, I could just think of how odd that might have seemed at first. I mean, now it's like, I mean, I just got my groceries delivered today. I don't know what he did when he got all everything. I don't know. Don't really care. I got the food. But in 2014, I would have been like, you're going to do my grocery shopping. That's a little odd. Yeah. So it's been pretty impressive that they've been able to grow this whole time because like 2014, oh my gosh, the old days, that was like six years before the pandemic. So they convinced a lot of people before online grocery was even cool to kind of work with them. And the one thing I do wish I asked him about with that is that since they got started, especially because they don't do perishable products, I know they do frozen stuff, which obviously has a short time span to get delivered and things like that. But Amazon has added so much stuff like that to their website. And even if their like grocery delivery service didn't take off, like I can go online and order Banza chickpea pasta on Amazon today if I wanted to. 
And it's like, I'm curious if that affects the competition at all, because I know the membership obviously helps people get lower prices at Thrive Market. But I mean, Amazon is like an absolute black pit of deals and buy this from this person and blah, blah, blah. And I personally don't think that's a great system. So maybe that's why people don't do it and choose to use Thrive Market. But I definitely wish I'd asked them more about the competition because it does seem like you could get this in other ways. Yeah, I know. I would also like to know more about the logistics of it because I was just thinking about it. I'm like, if you live in a food desert and you're ordering something like, I don't know, meat or something that perishes or ice cream, how do they ship it to you that fast? This is also me probably not knowing much about shipping logistics overall, but I'm like, where are they that they can just get it to you super fast or like much faster than a store in the area that wouldn't have it could. Because I'm like, if someone can ship to that area, then surely those grocery stores in the area could pair with a bigger retailer to just get that food to begin with. Yeah, it's such like a low margin business too, just like groceries in general, that it's like hard to even, like, I don't know how easy it is for them to set up that kind of stuff, but maybe it is. I feel like I know more about this than most people because I read about it, but I definitely don't know everything. No, yeah, now I'm going to go down the deep dive of, logistics (laughs) logistics <laughs> oh you should I, it's so good well what do you know what do you know because now i'm really curious what do you know about shipping logistics well i know that the majority of the produce and stuff you buy at a grocery store sits in warehouses within the set driving distance from the grocery store and they keep them there in a state where they are not ripe yet and then they flash ripen them and ship them to stores so when you buy like apples at the store sometimes they were picked over a year ago Ew. Okay. So like when I think of flash ripe and I think of like an apple under a lamp and then they turn on a lamp and then it like something it. like that. Ew. <laughs> this is why America's I went to when I was in Europe last week, I was telling everyone I was like, finally, I can eat dairy because I was like, you don't know what they're serving us over there. It's like, I can't eat the dairy over there. I have to eat as much cheese as possible right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can only give so much faith to the U.S. food system in general, but at least like Thrive Market, they're like, no dyes, no this, no that. Like I, they're, they're trying to give us that nice European food model and delivered from online. It's so novel. I love it. It's such a luxury, actually, thinking about it. Non-poisoned food and you get it online. It's perfect. Found is hosted by myself, TechCrunch senior reporter Becca Skutak, alongside senior reporter Dominic Midori davis Found is produced by Maggie Stamets with editing by Kel. Our illustrator is Bryce Durbin. Found's audience development and social media is managed by Morgan Little, Alyssa Stringer, and Natalie Kreisman. TechCrunch's audio products are managed by Henry Pickovit. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Listener.